Let us pray. May your spirit lead us today, our God, that we might hear a word for ourselves, for our community and beyond, that your spirit may be the guide and inspiration for all we do. Amen. It seems a great pity that the church has not had more to say uh, during both this pandemic and the new elements of society that are going to emerge after it has finally had its way with us. There's several reasons why the church doesn't get an opportunity to speak into our society today. We know that much of it is to do with us. Of course, for a hundred years of behaviour, we have not necessarily spoken what our community has wanted to hear. And of course, recently, the child abuse scandals have more than diminished the moral authority that we may have once had. The hypocrisy shown by the church at large is both cruel and have a, has a devastated way with credibility. But it's more than that. Our unwillingness often within the church to embrace the new world by doggedly clinging to the past has often made us irrelevant to our culture and to our society. And I don't mean by that just the surface things, but the deeper aspects of life that we have not been able to find the words, the language, in order to translate to our community. Anselm, the monk and theologian, and Archbishop of Canterbury, in the 11th century wrote that faith must always be seeking understanding. Faith must always be seeking understanding. For him, as it must be for us today, faith and religion, beliefs, are not static, but are willing to change and to engage when truth is offered to us. Beliefs, dogma and opinions will not protect us from truth. And truth is found in many places in our world and we must always be willing to listen to it. As I said last week, there is only one reality in life and therefore our responsibility is to listen, to engage with science, evolution, physics, psychology and all of the cultural shifts that happen within our world. But to engage in conversation, not in conflict, we have much to offer and we don't need to fear that our contribution will necessarily be lost if we can find the way that others will able to hear it and we're willing to listen to them. Our religion is not an escape from the world but it's an adventure into the world. And that doesn't weaken our faith. I would say, in fact, that it strengthens our faith. When we stand on ecclesiastical authority or take the moral high ground and claim that we cannot be questioned, we alienate ourselves from the majority of our fellow citizens. And I would say, from the movements of God's spirit. Perhaps the present COVID crisis gives us a rare opportunity to speak our truth as we listen to others. Now, this is not the way we will get people to come back to church necessarily. And really, that's not the objective. But rather a way that the good news can be heard by people who perhaps wouldn't hear it if it wasn't spoken in a certain way and a certain language. The early church never converted the society until ecclesiastical and political authority merged in the third and fourth century, and it was not a happy marriage. 
The Christian gospel suffered because of this bringing together both religious authority and political authority. The 19th century British politician Lord Acton oft said, quote, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That conveys the opinion that as power increases, moral sense diminishes. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And sadly, that at times has been the position of Christianity as it found itself in the last 18 centuries connected to political power. We have a story to tell. We have a life-changing story to tell. And we don't need the political system to uphold our story, nor do we even need the ecclesiastical authority. What we need are people with changed hearts and changed minds to share their experience with those around them. We may never be more than salt of the earth and a light to the world, but that can make all the difference. When in doubt, go back to the beginning, someone once told me. Or perhaps I read that in Winnie the Pooh. I can't quite remember now. So we did go back to the beginning. We went back to the book of Acts. And we read this particular book as the beginning of that Christian movement. It can give us insights and be helpful, but it must be read in the right way. I say the right way because it's not a journalistic history of the first hundred years of the Christian project. It calls for careful interpretation, led by what we often call in theological circles a hermeneutic key, that is, an interpretive key. What do we approach the scriptures with and the book of Acts with? We approach it with the words of Jesus and later the words of John, 1 John, God is love, and the words and teachings of Jesus. That's central, and everything else radiates out from that. And so when we read this book of Acts and the stories that we read here, we interpret them through the words, teaching, life, experience of Jesus. We take this with us as we read our sacred text. And as we have knowledge of the times and more of the culture and more of the people who lived in that time, we have greater understanding of how we should live today. We have already seen that the infant community took their understanding of faith seriously, but they also expressed it in the language, the culture and the understandings of the day. If they didn't, they wouldn't have been intelligible. People wouldn't have understood what they were saying. So the challenge for us today is not to remain within the first century, but rather to find that wor those words and that language, that which is perhaps behind the text, in order to spread the message of the good news within our society. Two stories we've touched on this morning in the book of Acts by going back to the beginning. The first one we only read the last part of, and that was, of course, the story of Stephen. Stephen was no slouch when he gave the religious leaders of the, of the day an alternative to their received history of the Hebrew faith. After a lengthy sermon, the religious leaders were enraged at what he said because he told them a different way of looking at the history that they had imbibed throughout their lives. And of course, you're not going to get a round of applause if you end your sermon with, you stubborn people, you have pagan hearts and ears. You are always resisting the spirit 
just as your ancestors did. In the past, they killed those who proclaimed the coming of the anointed one, just as you did. You who had the truth brought to you by God are the very ones who have not kept it. The, the religious leaders were infuriated. When they heard this and the ground, they ground their teeth and put their hands over their ears. Then they rushed at Stephen and stoned him to death. I'd suggest that this remains the primary ways in which nations in the 21st century deal with those who disagree with their history. If somebody gives an alternative view, another way of looking at what one believes and holds dearly, often it raises violence within us. Violence remains the prominent force to resist and resolve, we think, conflicts. Different thoughts, different ideas, contrary beliefs, challenges to our sacred histories. Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa was fond of saying, good is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Love, light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours through him who loves us. The victory has already been won. But in the process of our apprehending this victory, appropriating it, there are going to be casualties. More of our people are going to be detained. More are going to be imprisoned. More are going to be killed. But my dear people, we have already won and they have lost. Those who support injustice always lose. But that's almost impossible. It's almost impossible to believe. He knelt down and with faith in God, Stephen said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Words that we have heard before uttered by Jesus. When Stephen was stoned to death, the people left and in many ways the church had its first martyr. But martyrdom and persecution is not a very good method to get rid of a movement. In fact, it often gives a movement life rather than death. The story of Stephen reminds us that the infant church did not see violence as the answer to conflict, even when they were subjected to it. And then the story, of course, follows on after the story of the magician, but the Philip story follows on, where Philip encounters another aspect of the church, where he encounters an administrative Jewish eunuch from Ethiopia. It illustrates a different picture of faith. Not this time violence and, and death, but rather intrigue and new life, faith seeking understanding. Philip sees this man returning from a religious festival in Jerusalem, reading from the book of Isaiah when he is approached by Philip. They enter into conversation and Philip's words eventually persuade the Ethiopian that Jesus of Nazareth is the promised Messiah. We don't know how long they spoke for, but we do know that the good news Philip shared with this man. And we know that it transformed his life. And the Ethiopian eunuch was not only moved by the words that Philip said, but his heart and his life began to change. 
He wanted to be a part of this new movement as Stephen was. Here is water, says the Ethiopian. What prevents me from being immersed? So they went down into the water and Philip baptised him. Again, as he spoke, as we spoke last week of the significance of symbols, this immersion, immersion into water, this baptism, is a symbol of new life, of turning from one way of being and turning toward another. It points beyond itself to an act of belonging, to this new and vital expression of faith that we call the body of Christ. There are few beliefs given in this story that the Ethiopian Ethiopian had to accept. No catechism as we know, but there was a heartfelt response by the foreign diplomat. Philip gave him enough to see that this was life-changing and he wanted to be a part of it. And of course it should be noted that he was a stranger, a foreigner, and yet welcomed into the Christian household. We know that race, national identity, nor anything else is a barrier to the mercy and love of God. I have come that you may have life and that you may have life in all of its abundance. And of course, Paul writing to the church at Galatia, for there is no longer a distinction between Jew or Gentile. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Impossible, you may say. When we look around the world today, we see so much division. But we are a people who believe in the impossible. For God is the God of the impossible. Lives can change. People can change. Nations can change. And we can live into the faith that we have been given as a gift from God. Amen.